Good morning, beloved. Glad to have you back. We're still in Revelation chapter 6. If you'd go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. To chronologically catch us up to speed. Uh, by now in the, in the timeline of this book, the church will have been raptured. John is in the spirit in the throne room giving us a detailed account of, of everything that he sees. Jesus has the title deed to the earth, the scroll with the seven seals, and he's broken two so far. The first seal unleashed the white horse rider upon the earth, who is identified as the character of Revelation known as the Antichrist, who then will be later revealed as the beast. The Antichrist went out to peacefully conquer. He instituted a treaty with Israel and the surrounding nations, bringing a temporary false peace that the world uh, will receive and hang on to for the first half of the tribulation until that peace is going to be broken by the second seal, the red horse rider. This rider unleashes war throughout the earth where men begin to slay one another. And this brings us to our third seal. So let's go ahead and proceed with reading the text of the day, verses 5 through Eight, uh, and then we'll ask for the Lord's favor. Amen? All right. Revelation chapter 6, beginning with verse 5. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. Let's pray. Lord, we love your word. We thank you for it. And we ask now that you would prepare our hearts and our minds to Receive your word and to, to receive the working power that it's going to go forth for and accomplish whatever you're sending it forth for. The work that you want to do with your word, we want to receive it. We want to be subject to it. We want to be enlightened by it, Lord. Whatever you're going to reveal to us this morning as we look intently at your word and, and as we're led by your spirit. We want to be subject and we want to learn of our great God. We want to be likened and fashioned further into the image of your son. So please now we ask, have your way. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ready? Verse 5. When he broke the third seal... I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. So far, the, the color of the horse has corresponded with the judgment of the seal being broken. The first being white because it was the Antichrist coming, uh, bringing this peace, posing as the Savior of the world. We, we've all seen a Western, right? The hero comes in on the white horse. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 
Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. So the Antichrist deceitfully shows up on a white horse and all the the trappings of righteousness to save the day, to, to bring peace to the world. And without the restrainer, the Holy Spirit in the world, there won't be any discernment that the people will have uh, to recognize and identify the Antichrist as who he truly is. You would think, you know, with it, it being so clearly laid out in Scripture, surely he's not going to you know, get by with this, but they won't have the Holy Spirit to lead them in truth. And the next seal is broken, unleashing the rider on, on the red horse, the red color uh, of blood-spilling war, men becoming homicidal maniacs, slaying one another, dismantling the false peace previously brought by the rider on the white horse. And on the heels of this bloodshed, wounded men scantily making it out with their lives, they're met by the rider on a black horse, black for famine, for death brought by the the scales in the hands of the rider, signifying the careful rationing of food. So let's read verse 6, and we'll see what these portions are. Verse 6, And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not damage the oil and the wine. Now, judging by the lack of gasps in the room, I'm guessing we're not all that familiar with uh, the measurement of a denarius. Uh, hey, will somebody come and make sure I'm plugged in up here? Please. No, my, my computer, not my mic. Thank you. Before my message disappears on you all. All right. Yeah, I don't think I have power wherever this cord's going to. Okay. We'll see what happens. Amen? All right. All right, a denarius. The Roman denarius was a a coin worth about 15 cents. Not 15 cents by today's monetary standards. In the wage scale of that time, it was common for a person to receive one denarius was one day's labor. Uh, This was fair, adequate payment by the employer. Consider the parable that Jesus told in Matthew 20 uh, regarding the landowner who hired men to to work his vineyard at, at various times throughout the day for the agreed upon wage of one denarius. And some of the workers became angry when when the payment was given, not because it was insufficient, but because some of the men who didn't work as long as others got paid the same amount. So they weren't upset with the payment, but that other men were paid. So the denarius was the agreed upon wage for the day. It was for a man to live life on. For our thinking, we could probably imagine $200, right? Uh, For a man to live on and provide for his family, $200 should just about get the job done, barring that you don't live in Arlington or some very expensive place, right? Budgeting that income, but it covers all expenses, right? Not just food, uh, health care, housing, clothing, repairs, everything. $200 is one denarius, one coin. John describes this time in the Great Tribulation when $200 will buy one measure of wheat or three measures of barley. And a lot of people look at this at the amount and they conclude that a man could could either buy wheat to feed himself for the day, that one measure, or he could buy the cheaper barley, which was essentially animal feed, and then he could feed his family with those three measures. Uh, However, a measure of wheat isn't a day's ration for a man. It's approximately what a laboring man would eat in one meal. Not one day, it's just one meal. So if he then used his denarius to buy barley, 
the cheaper grain, he would have enough from his day's wages to buy three measures or three meals of barley. Whether he bought the barley or not, three measures is not enough to feed someone's family. One meal of wheat had more nutritional value, so even though purchasing the three barley measures would spread the portions out to three meals, those three meals didn't have the nutritional value of wheat. So three meals with not enough nutritional value being divided between the man of the home, right? He has to work to provide, so he has to eat. He has to to dig the ditch to get the money to buy the bread to get the strength to dig the ditch. He has to eat. A wife, one child. That's one poor meal a day with not enough nutrition. What if you have three children? And this is one of those things where we'll struggle to grasp it in the West, in America, the severity of that circumstance. Because we just don't see people scattered in the streets starving to death. We don't see that. Um, So I'll have us look at a few places for a few biblical accounts to show the gravity of the situation and the behaviors and the manners of men as the situation progressively gets worse. Uh, So the first stop will be Genesis chapter 47. What we'll read is a, it's a great illustration of people dealing with a famine in the land. Uh, we'll get a good look at how starving people behave and the thought process of a starving man. Genesis 47, beginning with verse 13. Now there was no food in all the land because the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food, for why should we die in your presence, for our money is gone? Then Joseph said, Give up your livestock. And I will give you food for your livestock, since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph. And Joseph gave them food in exchange for their horses and their flocks and their herds and their donkeys. And he fed them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent And the cattle are my my Lord's. There is nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian sold his field, because the famine was very severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he removed them to the cities from one end of Egypt's border to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had an allotment from Pharaoh, and they lived off the allotment which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, he did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have today bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is your seed, and you may sow the land. At the harvest, you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be for your own seed, shall be your own for seed of the field, and for your food, and for those of your household. And as food for your little ones. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, 
and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. Joseph made a statute concerning the land of Egypt valid to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. Only the land of the priest did not become Pharaoh's. We'll stop there. Notice the progression that takes place. Man empties his reserves for purchasing food. He spends all that he has and he doesn't have the ability to retain one dollar, one shekel. All of the money in Egypt is spent for food. And once the money was gone, all the way gone, right? Not just when money is tight, they are broke. There's still the need. So the people did what we see people do in our culture. Unfortunately, they usually do this for drugs or something like that. When, when all the money is spent, the next stop is the pawn shop. They sell off their belongings. And the people of Egypt begin to hamstring themselves by offering their livestock. Because it's not their grandmother's jewelry. This is their livelihood. This is how they make their living. This would be like if a mechanic were to go sell his tools. That's how short-sighted the people had become. And that's how little hope they had, how irrational their thinking became. Until finally, they sell themselves into slavery. And when we read that, we may wonder you know, how, how crippled someone's psyche must be to get to the point where their freedom is on the table. I'll be your slave. I will sell myself to you. Because we live in America where the words of Patrick Henry are ringing in our ears, you know, give me liberty or give me death. I don't think Patrick was starving when he said that. Freedom is, is not the end all be all for a man, especially men who aren't born again. Uh, Philippians 3.18-19 for many walk of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Their flesh is their God. Their natural fleshly desires are the supreme ruling authority in their lives, so when faced with the choice between freedom or food, it's not a difficult decision to make. It's, it's merely a transaction for them. The same way that Esau, when he was so famished and he sold his birthright to Jacob for some soup, just for a bowl of red, he said, behold, I'm about to die, so what use is the birthright to me? And the people of Egypt concluded the same thing. They said, you have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. Hooray! We are slaves to Pharaoh. Yes! They were, they were happy to do it. All they wanted was their fleshly appetite satiated, and that's just sinful man. Dealing rationally in his mind under the weight of famine. Okay, the other place I want us to look, 2 Kings chapter 6, please. Go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Don't mind me. 2 Kings chapter 6. What's that over there? We'll pick up in verse 24. Now it came about after this that Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, gathered all his army, and went up and besieged Samaria. There was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it. 
until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and a fourth of cab of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help my lord, O king. He said, If the Lord does not help you, from where shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And the king said to her, What is the matter with you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him, and I said to her on the next day, Give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. When the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath his body. Let's stop there. In Genesis 47, we read about the famine, but where there were, there were reserves of food. And when it came down to it, man would sell himself for food. For, for a sinful man, nothing else takes precedence over surviving. Especially freedom. They gladly sold themselves. But now we're reading about a famine in the land where no one knew it was coming. Right? Joseph knew it was coming, so he was, hey, we need to store up food for the famine. So no one has food stored beforehand. And on top of the famine... The king of Aram has come and is besieging the city to deplete any and all resources that they had, which was zero. So there was no opportunity for the people to sell themselves for food because there was no food. But the people had money. So people who have money, but they don't have food, what do they do? There was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and a fourth of cob of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. That's not food. In man's desperation to survive, to scavenge and to scrape up just a minuscule amount of nutrients, from whatever he could get his hands on, a donkey's head, bird poop, man will sink his teeth into his own child if it means survival for himself. When the third seal breaks, there will be a world full of starving, sinful men that God is going to show firsthand what man is capable of. Men who think, they have a detached sense of morality from God. Men that think they have their own innate goodness, their own self-determined standards of good, their own convictions and non-negotiables, and God is going to hit them with hunger pains until they eat their own babies. When the Holy Spirit and all of God's children are removed from the world, Man is going to find out just how much like an animal he can behave and just how base he can be. Have you ever seen a dog eat its own afterbirth? They eat the placenta afterwards, and it's the most bizarre thing in the world, and men and women are going to do this during the tribulation. They're going to eat their own babies. They're going to fight over whose baby they get to eat. And it's not a new breed of man, a man made that way by the tribulation. That's just man without God. That's man today. That's our unsaved neighbors and relatives. That's anyone without the restraining power of the Holy Spirit. Given the opportunity, and if they get hungry enough. Alan Mocker Institute reports one million abortions occur each year in the U.S. And there's no famine in the land. You think killing a child to eat them because you're starving to death is crazy. 2,700 people kill a baby every day in the U.S. because it interferes with their work. One of the worst aspects about the third seal being broken won't be the hunger pains. It won't be watching someone's loved one starve to death before their eyes. It'll be experiencing the unbridled depravity of starving man. 
depravity that's already there, it's living among us today, its true colors will be shown by the tribulation, by circumstance and opportunity. That's all sinful man is lacking to start eating their own babies, circumstance and opportunity. We see sinful man in our current environment, surrounded by abundance and social safety nets. So we see them fat and lazy. And they murder babies for the sake of convenience, not self-preservation. Wait until they get really hungry. It'll be a decision like that. It'll be easy for them. I want us to keep considering this thought as we move through these judgments. At any moment, everyone we know and love who doesn't know Jesus can have this as their future. Most of you know I'm a, I'm a prodigal. And when I was running hard with the world, my parents, they would try to talk to me. Uh, I'm sure like a lot of you, try to talk to some of your wayward children. And throughout that entire time, years and years and years of running, I remember one spiritual conversation I had. It was with my dad, and we were driving down some back road, and he just told me, you know, if the rapture happens, there will still be time for you to repent during the tribulation. And I didn't get mad at him. I didn't argue. I, I didn't say anything, and he didn't say anything else, and we just rode home in silence. And... I wish more people told me more truth like that more often instead of just talking about our shared interests. Amen? You guys can flip back to Revelation. There's one last part of verse 6 before we move on. The command is given and do not damage the oil and the wine. There's an interesting quote from Barnhouse. He's regarding his own personal experience. Just after World War I, I spent a few days in Vienna at the time when misery was very great. There was a shortage of coal, and the police had ordered everyone off the streets by 9 o'clock. The city was filled with wealthy refugees from Russia and other countries. Walking along the boulevard one afternoon as the crowds were coming out of the opera, which began early to conform with the curfew regulations, I saw men with bare feet in the snow, their skeletons covered with rags, their ribs seen through the holes in the clothes which they attempted to cover their bodies. From time to time, there was blood on the snow from their feet. Out of the opera came men escorting women with fortunes and jewels upon them. Never have I seen more wonderful displays in any of the capitals of the earth. The beggars blocked the way of the fine limousines that came for the rich. I saw the men striking the beggars with their canes to clear the way for the women. Poor girls, not clad in the gaudy finery of prostitutes, but with poor clothing and wooden shoes, clattered about clutching at the passerby offering to sell themselves for a coin, which at the moment could be purchased for one five hundredth part of a dollar. Mark well, there was no famine in Vienna. There was scarcity in the midst of plenty, but there was no hurt to the luxuries, end quote. This will be the circumstance and there's a lot of different interpretations as to what's taking place here. Um, some will say that it's a, a comfort of the Lord given amidst the, the tribulation. I don't personally see that. I, I don't wholeheartedly subscribe to any of the, the interpretations. And I can't tell you 100% why God says don't damage the oil or the wine. But I suspect it's something to do with the reality and the symbolism of what oil and wine represent throughout the, the Bible. Oil is a luxury item. It soothes and brings healing. It softens and relieves. Oil in the Bible is a representation of the Holy Spirit. 
And when a man would, would become king, for instance, he would have oil dumped on his head, representing the Holy Spirit to anoint them, to be filled and led by God's Spirit. And then there's wine. Psalm 104, 15. And wine which makes man's heart glad, so that he may make his face glisten with oil and food which sustains man's heart. Proverbs 31, 6 and 7. Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his trouble no more. In Ecclesiastes 10.19 Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry. So oil brings healing, and wine brings happiness both of which had the ministry of pointing somewhere beyond the immediate physical work of healing and happiness. Oil pointed to the true anointing that comes from God by His Holy Spirit for the softening of the heart and the relief of the soul. Wine pointed to the everlasting joy that's only found in salvation through Jesus. But the earth dwellers of the world will never look past the physical. They never consider for a second to pursue more than the satisfaction of the flesh. And there's nothing more for them in this life than to be healthy and happy. There's no industry that competes with the health industry, with the medical field, with the pharmaceutical companies. People prioritize their health over everything except happiness until they pursue their happiness to the point that it begins to inhibit their health, right? Someone will drink because it makes them happy and they'll drink until they have liver failure. They'll eat McDonald's until they get diabetes and then they have to, they have to dial it back. They have to strike a balance between their health and their happiness. Consider the prosperity gospel. How many people Come to God, not for God, but for health and wealth. These two items that the world is so convinced, that's what life is all about. Health and happiness. Whatever brings me these two things is all that I need. And There's going to come a time in the great tribulation where that's all they have. Wine and oil the things that took precedence over everything else in their life. And it's not going to do anything for them. A starving man doesn't want wine. It doesn't make him happy. It makes him sick. Ingesting olive oil, it expedites digestion. But there's no food to digest. What effect do you think that will have on an empty stomach or wine on a starving stomach? These luxury items that the world is left with will do nothing for them except make them sick and you won't be able to pay them to touch them. And all that anyone will want is bread. Jesus said in John 6, 33, for the bread of God, that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. That's irony. They rejected Jesus being the bread of life for eternal life. And now they're begging for bread for life for a day. Day by day, one day at a time, scraping together enough wheat or barley just to make a little hamburger bun of a loaf of bread, using balances and measuring out portions unfit even for a small child. And they still won't allow the words of Jesus to penetrate their heart. They'll be cursing the wine and the oil. Give me bread. I need bread. Man doesn't live by bread alone. It's still won't click. Men still won't call on the name of the Lord. And while they're making new notches in their belt to cinch it down further and further, daydreaming about sinking their teeth into their neighbor's baby, 
It wasn't that long ago when it was Thanksgiving dinner at Grandma's. 1 Thessalonians 5.3, while they were saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. The world's head is going to spin at how fast all of this will unfold. You all remember the food shortages that happened a few years ago, right? The whole country was caught off guard. We got things off the shelves that I had never eaten before, right? But it, it, it's what was there, so we ate it. In the tribulation, the world is going to get hit with hunger pains like labor pains. It's going to be sudden and inescapable. I'm so glad I won't be here for it. As, as I read on, every seal that's broken, every trumpet blown, every bowl poured out, I keep thinking the same thing. I'm so glad I'm not going to be here for it. Let's look at our next seal to break. Verses 7 and 8. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked and behold an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to him, given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Keithley said this, quote, The color of this horse is ashen, a pale or yellowish green. The same Greek word is used in Revelation 9.4 of green vegetation. It's the Greek word chloros, which denotes a yellowish green, the light green of a plant or paleness of a person who is critically ill. Our word chlorophyll or chlorine comes from this word. We are told the name of this horse is death and that Hades follows. Death refers to the physical death, not annihilation. Only the physical body is claimed. Hades refers to the underworld, the prison and temporary quarters of the souls of unbelievers between their death and the time of the great white throne judgment. This is the compartment called torments in the parable of Luke 16. Luke 16, 19-24 Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores. And longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming, licking his sores. Now the poor man died, and he was carried away to the angels, by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame." The fact that Hades is involved here in this seal would suggest that these mass casualties will die in their sin outside of Christ. They'll go to hell just like everyone outside of the tribulation who dies without a life-saving faith in Christ Jesus. For those who convert during the tribulation and then die via persecution, tribulation saints as they're called, heaven is their soul's destination, not Hades. So to the pale horse rider, authority was given to him to kill over a fourth of the earth's population. By war from the red horse, famine from the black horse, pestilence is death by disease and plague, certainly brought about by the sheer uh, constant surrounding of corpses. Everyone will be dead. 
a quarter of the earth's population by today's number is 2 billion people that go to Hades. Take all of North America, all of South America, and all of Europe. Gone. And man is going to be so weakened and sick and frail that the ones who are still hanging on, the wild beasts of the earth are going to be emboldened and they're going to start picking man off. Years ago, I was on a mission trip in, in Kentucky with my wife, and we were up in the hollers. And we did an afternoon trip to a veteran center. Brought him some, some boots and gave testimony. And there was a man there. He was a mountain of a man. I, he was tall, and he looked like a statue, like he was made out of stone. He... He was at least 70, but he was a man's man. He looked like he was raised by wolves. And he told me where he used to live before he was at the center, before he got to where he was. He had a cabin up in some mountain in Kentucky. He lived there by himself. He said there wasn't anyone else around for miles in any direction. He was the only one. And he said that the deer and the elk and the bear, they'd come eat out of his hand. He was probably the only man that they ever saw. And generally, animals are that way. They don't see people and see lunch um, unless they're provoked or trained a certain way. They're not naturally bold and hostile toward humans. God made them that way. Genesis 9-2, God said, The fear of you, the fear of man, and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky. And that's going to change. When men have halfway slain each other and they're barely hanging on, bleeding all over the place, and buzzards are circling above, they're going to hear wolves and bear and coyotes and the pitter-patter of dogs' feet. And next thing you know, they're being eaten alive. What the rulers of ancient Rome did to the Christians in the Colosseum, feeding them to lions and hungry dogs for sport and entertainment, God is going to unleash the entire animal kingdom on mankind. All of the wild beasts of the world are going to move in and circle the inner cities and start hunting people. I would much rather view this from the throne room than trying to evade a cheetah that's escaped from the Luray Zoo. Amen? Everyone can amen that especially those who don't look like they get around as fast as others, right? That's a movie I would pay to see if Hollywood would do a really good representation of the biblical account of this seal being broken. All right, that's where we'll have to stop for today. Will you all stand with me? There's not a whole bunch of upticks to end on throughout the, the judgments that we read about, except you don't have to be there. That's always the bright side of going through Revelation. You don't have to experience it. Amen? Father, thank you for sending your Son to absorb all of the wrath that was rightfully ours. Thank you for sending him. Thank you for sending him. Please, Lord, help us to be good stewards of the time that you tarry. Help us to be mindful of the future of the world, that it's not bright and it's not getting better. Please keep a zeal for man in our hearts, Lord. Please, Lord. We love you. We thank you for what you've done in our lives. We thank you for the work that you keep doing through us, Lord, and that you're so patient that you don't want anyone to perish. You want everyone to come to the saving knowledge of your Son, Lord. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.